Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Got all of our classes starting, and of course, this one is no different. And we're glad to have all of the adults, those that's able to be here today in our adult class. And we have a special uh, guest that's going to be teaching this morning, and that is Brother Justin Morgan. Man, and I'm excited about this. I want him to come. Why don't we just stand right now? Let's lift our hands as he's coming. Let's just invite the presence of the Lord into this adult Bible study today. Praise the Lord. I'm excited um, to be teaching this morning. Um, I'm used to teaching to a captive audience. <laughs> Those that know uh, know me know, know I do prison ministry. Uh, the first the first time I'd ever preached outside of prison, um, it was for Brother Pittman, my uncle, in Coontz, and he said, "Now, brother, I'm just going to let you know these people they can get up and walk out." So, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I- I'm thankful for what God's done in my life and, and, and in my family. And uh, uh, I hope to um, portray some of that this morning. I'm thankful for our pastor and our assistant pastor. And uh, we are blessed with the best, folks. And I'm thankful for the confidence that he has in me. And um, thankful for my wife. Uh, I couldn't make it without her. She's been the best thing besides the Holy Ghost that's happened to me. I mean, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Amos chapter 9, um, verse 14. And the Bible says, And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the wasted cities. And inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof, and they shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I had given them, saith the Lord thy God. What I want to talk about just for a little while this morning is what I've learned about restoration. Amen. Why don't we lay our Bibles down? Let's uh, let's lift our hands towards the only one that can help us this morning. Let's pray and ask for His anointing and blessing to be over this service. God, we thank you, Lord. God, for what you do in our lives, Lord. Lord I'm asking you, Lord, to move in this house today, God. God, anoint my lips to pray, God, and teach your word, God. Anoint the people in their ears and their hearts, God, to receive, Lord, I pray, what you would have them to receive, God. Hallelujah, thank God. I love you, thank Jesus. You. I thank you. Thank you. Amen. Jesus' name. You may be seated. So, the, I got a few illustrations that I want to use this morning. And this first illustration is absolutely free to you. But it was not cheap for me. So, um, back in February, we were going to a prison ministry conference, and, uh, you know, I could feel the excitement building, and I was just ready to go, and it was a week and a half, and uh, some of the mechanics in this place is going to identify with with what I'm about to tell you, but um, I was putting a camshaft and uh, new rockers on a C-15 cat, and uh, got it all done, Uh, got the overhead adjusted, Everything was perfect. Cranked it up, and it just, you know, the owner was sitting there when we cranked it up, and he was like, man, it's never sounded this good. You know, we had everything adjusted, and uh, whenever we set the valves on one, whenever I adjust the valves, I I turn my phone off. uh, I lock myself. You can ask the guys that's worked for me. I'm very particular in how I do that. I, I, I say, look, man, someone comes up, tell them not to bother me. And I have a paint marker in one hand and 
uh, my tools in, in the other hand. And as I go along, adjusting the valves, I'm marking them, checking them off. And I, I'm very careful in how I do it. Well, um, he left out for a test drive. It ran great. He hit the Jake brakes, and there was a loud pop. And then it started uh, knocking real bad. And so uh, he called me, and I went out, and I looked at it. I cranked it up and immediately shut it off. It, uh, it, it sounded terrible. And uh, I, could, I, could, I could tell this was about to cost me a lot of money. And so uh, I get a wrecker to pick up this truck and bring it back to the shop. And uh, it's Thursday night, and then I've, I've got a week and a half until uh, this conference. So I'm stressed out, worried about it. Uh, I'm hoping that it's no big deal, that something maybe on the overhead just come loose. But uh, I get it back in the, um, like I say, I know this is going to sound like gibberish to some of you, but some of you are going to be able to identify where I'm at. But uh, the Jake Housen had exploded. The uh, exhaust valve got held down too long, and the piston come up and uh, basically ruined the engine. Uh, so here I am Thursday night. I, I, I pull the valve covers off. I figure out what's going on, and I'm now I'm worried. This guy, it, this engine was not in a... A uh, fleet of 15 fleets. It was an owner operator who had been off of work for a few weeks while I was working on it. So now the pressure's really on because this guy depends to make his whole living on this. And so uh, I begin the task of tearing it down and, you know, worried about how, how I'm going to fix it. I wasn't worried about the money. I was worried about what went wrong and how can we fix this in a week and a half. So we, uh, Dad come over, and uh, he felt sorry for me. He does that every now and then. <laughs> and uh, he helped me. Uh, we, we got it tore apart real quick and got all the parts we needed ordered. And uh, it come in. We put it back together. And... I worked, uh, I asked Pastor, I said, well, Pastor, you know, I, I got to go Wednesday. You know, uh, what do you think about me working on it after church? And I cleared it with him. He said, son, as long as you fulfill your obligations here, yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't mind you working on it. You know, and, and so uh, Sunday, I uh, worked on it that Sunday and began to, the Lord began to talk to me. Because, you know, any time you've got something going on in your life, you need to ask yourself, why, why am I going through this? And, uh, you know, the Bible says that God does not tempt us. Temptation does not come from the Lord. But when things happen in your life, God uses those things to show you a lesson. And so I asked the Lord while I was working on it, I said, God, what, what can I learn from this? And many times when I was working on that truck, I would, I would be by myself and all alone and I, I would be praying and many times I would have to set my tools down because of the presence of God that would come into the shop. And I was praying about it and I said, God, what can I learn from this? And the Lord taught me a few things. So on an engine... There's a couple of things to figure out whether or not it can be restored or rebuilt. Uh, the, one of the first things is, do I have the knowledge to fix this engine? Do I have the capability, the tools necessary to fix this engine? And when it comes to a cat, I had the tools, I had the knowledge to do it, and I, and I, I felt comfortable doing it. I had built several of them, and so I felt comfortable. But had it been another engine, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't have. It had it been an ISX Cummins, I would have been like, no, I I, I can't do it. 
Had it been a, a, a Mac, I would have felt comfortable. But say it had been at another shop and they didn't feel comfortable, they may have, may have opted out to change the whole engine out. And people do that. Um, even when it can be rebuilt, they, they still change, just do a whole swap. The other thing is, is this engine cost effective to be rebuilt? In other words, can I just buy another engine and exchange it for what this engine is going to cost? Say like maybe the block is messed up and it's got to be sent off and repaired and that adds to the cost. Or maybe some of the other parts are, are ruined and, and that adds to the cost. But in theory, any engine can be rebuilt. Blocks can be repaired. Cylinder heads can be, cracked cylinder heads can be repaired. They can be restored. But somebody has got to be willing to pay the price for what it takes to restore it. But I've come to tell you today that God does have the knowledge that it takes. He made us. He knows everything about us. He knows humanity's shortcomings and downfalls and it has not changed one bit. God knows us and he knows how to fix us and put it back, put us back together. And the Bible says, for ye are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from vain conversations received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. As a lamb without blemish and without spot. So I've come to tell you today that he has already paid the price. He has already paid the price to fix us. And God would rather restore us than he would throw us away. But Steve, Steve Wind owned the Pablo Picasso painting known as the La Rev or... The dream. He was looking to sell this painting to create more room in his collection. See, he was a lover of art. He absolutely loved art, and it, it just uh, it blew his mind uh, the beauty of it. But he needed to make some more room in his collection, so he calls this guy named Stephen Wynn, and they set it up, and uh, I'm sorry, Stephen Cohen decides to buy the painting, the Larev from Mr. Wynn, and they agreed on a price of $139 million. So Mr. Mr. Wynn, he, he says, all right, you know, they, they, they get it all worked out, and the day before he sells him the painting, this guy's already uh, bought, and paid for it, but the day before he he uh, he throws a dinner party, one of the most expensive dinner parties in the world. <laughs> he he invites all of his closest friends and his family, and he wants to celebrate this beautiful painting and the last day that he's going to have with it. And during the dinner party, um, Mr. Wynn he has a, a problem with his eyes and. Uh, whenever you can't see that well, some, you'll lose balance. And he lost balance, and his elbow went through this $139 million painting. He stumbles around there, and then he stands up, and he says, Well, at least nobody is dead. He said, and at least i done it. So he has to call this man the next day and tell him that $139 million painting that you already bought has a hole in it. <laughs> I've had to make some calls in my lifetime, but I've never had to make that kind of call. <laughs> so he calls him and he tells him, he said, look, it's ruined, but here's Here's the options here. He said, there is an insurance policy and um, you can redeem it 
and we'll get your money back like this, uh, or I will buy it back from you. And Mr. Cohen said he didn't even have to get off the phone for he knew what he was going to do. He allowed Mr. Wynn to buy it back from him. He said uh, later in an interview, he said, if I knew if I would have um, redeemed it with the insurance company, that painting would be tucked away somewhere and forgotten. But I knew if Mr. Wynn, because see, Mr. Wynn was a lover of art. He, Mr. Cohen was an investor. He was a collector. But Mr. Wynn, it was, it was much more to him than just that. He was a, a lover and a, an appreciator of art. He said, and I knew if I, if I put the painting back in the hands of the one who really, really loved it, that something would happen with it and it wouldn't just be forgotten. So Mr. Wynn, he looks and he finds an art surgeon. Who would have ever thought that that would even exist? But the art surgeon looks over this painting and he says, you know, I, I believe that we can, we can fix this. He said, uh, at the front, when I'm done with it, it's, it's going to take some time. But when I'm done with this, you'll never be able to tell from the front that anything had ever happened to it. He said, but if you look at the backside, it will always tell the tale. Some of you in this place today, you're looking around at, at, at some of us and and if you know me, you know I don't. You know I got problems, and <laughs> we all have problems. But but maybe you're looking at some of us in this place today, and you're saying, "Man, they've got it all together. Everything's everything's great." But if you could see on the inside the the places where the great Master has put us back together time and time again, you would see the the cracks and the the sutures and where God has put us back together. But this art surgeon kept this painting for a while and then he, he gave it back to him. And he was right. It was beautiful. Everything was perfect on it. And Mr. Cohen ended up buying the painting again. But this time he didn't pay $139 million. He paid $155 million. But I, I want to tell somebody in this place today, don't listen to the enemy. Don't, don't, cash, don't cash it out on that insurance policy. Don't throw it up and don't, don't, don't throw it all away and give, in, and, and give up. But, but you need to put your hands... Hallelujah. And the one, the lover of your soul, the one that loves you and the one that can make it all happen and put it all back together again. Put your hands into the one that loves you. My, my, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I'm so thankful that we have this word. The Word of God is a glimpse into the heart of our Creator. And there's a, a story that always moves me and, and touches my heart. And it's the story of Hosea and Gomer. Hosea was a prophet. And the Lord spoke to him and he said, I, I want you to take a wife of whoredoms uh, and marry this harlot. And I, I can't imagine I would be like, God, I, uh, I'm a man of God. You know, you, you want me to speak to your people, and this is what you want me to do? But he, he went ahead and did it anyway, and, and he, he married this, this, this woman, Gomer. And uh, they had three kids together, and he loved her. But you know... Somewhere along the way, something happened and she left and went back to her original life. 
And I've come to tell you that when you're new and, 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 and God restores you and God brings you out of darkness, somewhere along the way, things are going to get tough. And what we do, we, we have not changed. Humanity has not changed. And what we do is we go back to what we're used to. But you know, whenever you go back, it's worse than it was before. It's always worse than it ever was. And I haven't told this story to many people, but, you know, I was seeking the Holy Ghost. And I really, really wanted the Holy Ghost bad. And, 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 I, knew, and I knew that if I got it, that the course of my life would change even greater than it had already changed. And, and I did everything to try to get the Holy Ghost. You know, I, I, I was taught a Bible study and I realized that I, I needed to be baptized in Jesus' name and receive the Holy Ghost and repent of my sins. And, and I spent time in repentance and time changing and uh, Brother Burks uh, baptized me and my wife in Jesus' name. Three weeks after we were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I'm just being honest with you this morning. And so I was seeking the Holy Ghost. And I had sought it for weeks and weeks. And everybody around me was getting it. Everybody around me. Uh, my mother got it. Um, but I'm, I'm being real candid with you this morning, but I received the Holy Ghost on a Sunday morning when the lights had went out. Uh, we had, we had brother juniors. Yeah. <laughs> the lights had went out and, uh, brother Blake had received the Holy Ghost. And then I, I come down later on and got it the same time. But that Wednesday before that, uh, Brother Talton Hall had received the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to be 100% honest with you. I didn't have the right spirit. I didn't have the, sp the spirit back then. All I had was the frustrations uh, of my addictions and still uh, fiending. <laughs> you know, fiending. So... Brother Hall got the Holy Ghost, Brother Talton Hall, and it made me so mad I couldn't see straight. I said, God, everybody in the world is getting the Holy Ghost. I said, I, I mean, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't know nothing about you, but, I, but I'm doing everything I can do. I mean, I'm making sure there ain't a mint in my mouth before I go to the altar. I mean, I don't want nothing to hinder me, you know. <laughs> And uh, I, I said, God, I, you know, I, I got mad. I got up middle of the service and left. I walked out and I, I went to my old 89 Chevrolet that I bought in high school. And uh, I said, God, if I said, I, I, I've quit drugs. I, I, I've quit a nicotine addiction. I've, I, I've, I've done all this. I, I've quit. I, I've done all this. If you don't want me to have the Holy Ghost, I don't want to have it. And I was getting in my truck, and I was, I'm going to be honest with you, I was going to pick up a pack of Marlboro Smooth. And I was, I was going to quit. But my dad, he ran out to the truck because he, he knew, he knew what, what was going on. And he, he took off. And he ran to the truck, and I've only told this to a handful of people, but with tears, he stopped me at my truck, and he said, son, I backslid when I was 17. He said, I tried to come back to God when I was 23. He said, and I, and, and I was seeking the Holy Ghost, and I didn't get it, and I got discouraged. And he said, and I left, and then I stayed out for 30 years. Don't, don't make the same mistake I did. And... He don't even know it, but that was a pivotal point in my life. 
And that next Sunday, I received the Holy Ghost. But my point is, in a trial or when things get uncomfortable, we want to go back to what is comfortable. And that's exactly what Gomer did. She went back to a life of prostitution. And, but whenever you go back, it gets, it gets worse. And she got to the point where she was being auctioned off. And the Bible lets us know that her husband, her husband, the Bible says in Hosea chapter 3, in verse 2, it says, So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for an homer of barley and half a homer of barley. But you see, God used this illustration so that we would understand his heart and how he feels. Can you imagine the hurt that he felt when his wife, the one he loved, had left him and had cheated on him and had found someone else, but he was willing to pay the price to redeem her, to bring her back. And the Lord used this illustration, and it says that in that day, saith the Lord, thou shalt call me Ishai, and shall call me no more Bali. And what that means, that Ishai means husband, and Bali means slave master. He bought her back by all rights. He was her master because he had bought her out of slavery. But he said, I don't, I don't want to, you to call me slave master. I want you to call me husband. And if you're wondering, we, sometimes we get a bad rap because we say, well, the people from the outside, they look at us and they say, well, you can't do that and you can't do this. And this is, that's bondage. But can I tell you today, Hallelujah. He's, I got a relationship with him. I become a part of the body, which is the bride of Christ. I've got a relationship with him. I, there's things that I don't do and there's places I don't go, not because of a rule, not because I'm in bondage, but because of a relationship I know what pleases my father. I, I've read his word. I, I, I've seen his heart speak to me through this word. And I'm not going to. I'm not going to break his heart. I'm not going to. How many times have I broke his heart? That's what touches me so much about this. Because you, you, we, you, we look at things through humanity's aspect. And that's, that's what we can see. Because that's, that's what we're familiar with. And we know how bad it hurts. To be cheated on and, 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 and things of that nature. But God in the same aspect. How many times have I hurt his heart? How many, how many times have I, have I strayed away. And went back to my first love. And broken his heart. But. The last thing I want to talk about is. When God restores you, it's not always back to the original condition. I don't think it ever really is. Jeremiah 18 verse 4 says, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again another vessel. As seemed good to the potter to make it. But you know. Some mistakes. Some of the mistakes that we can make. Will put us away. From where we were supposed to be. There's callings that. That are on our lives that. that and, 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 and things that God wants to use us in. 
But there are some mistakes that will take that away. That because of this mistake, you, I can't use you right here anymore. And that happens. But don't get frustrated because of the vessel that God's building now. Quit. Don't be praying prayers like, put me back where I was, God. Uh, you know, repair this and, 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 and fix this. But, but put your trust in the lover. Put your trust in the one that's making this new vessel. And say, God, uh, I may not ever be what you originally called me to be. But God, I'm going to trust you. God, I, I want you to put the pieces back together however you see fit. In whichever way you need, you want to use me from now on, that's the way I, I want to be used by you. It, 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 because of my background, it, that might be why I'm involved in prison ministry. But you know what? They need the Holy Ghost too. David was just like this. He, he wanted more, more than anything to build a temple. But he could never do it. His hands were too bloody to build the temple of God. But you know what? He put it into his son. His son knew how important that that temple was. But you know some things you may not ever do for God. There may be things you want to do for God that God can't use you in anymore. And that's okay. But maybe He'll use your child to do it. Maybe you'll, you'll get to see it. Maybe you won't get to see it. My grandmother never got to see me live for God. But the prayer she prayed for me. I, I've... I'm going to try to keep it. I've got a little bit of time, but I've I studied everything that I could study. I studied Rastafariism. Does anybody even know what that is? All right, I'm the only one in this place that knows what that is. Oh, Brother Daniel, I got away from Brother Daniel. <laughs> I studied that, uh, Mormonism. I studied everything I could get my hands on. And then I... I said to myself that there was no God and I quit looking. And I believed, 100% believed that there was no God. And many of you know my testimony, but I was working on a truck at the shop and it began to roll and I was underneath it. And... I screamed as loud as I could possibly scream. I screamed so loud that people across the street that work in the other building come running over there. And the driver was in the truck and he stopped. But when he stopped, my body was underneath this truck. My legs was originally hanging out in between both of the sets of tires. And so whenever the truck started to move, I knew I couldn't get back out this way. So I tried to scoot myself up underneath. And I almost made it all the way up underneath the truck, but the tire pinned my leg. And uh, it pinned my foot down and I couldn't move. So I, I screamed as loud as I could. And I, um, the driver heard me and he was in the truck and he stepped on the brakes and Folks, this is an absolute miracle if you understand the full aspect of it. My dad knows this truck was a piece of junk. Okay? How many know about air brakes? All right. If you've got a really good truck, the air pressure will hold, you know, four or five hours. But 90% of the trucks rolling down this highway, if you turn the key off, within two minutes, you got zero. And this truck was, uh, it was a piece of junk. 
it was a miracle that it had air pressure. The other miracle, the guy that drives the truck, he don't even drive trucks anymore. He had gotten so many wrecks. And he got so so many accidents. He was uninsurable. He don't even drive a truck no more. He sells cars in Silsby. Can I get a witness? And I'm depending on this guy to save my life. And he backs up. I, you know, I, I tell him to, to stop. I scream out as loud as I can, and he stops. Well, he's still on my foot, so I, I can't move. So I'm, I'm guiding him with my voice. And we're, we're on a hill. And how many know when you're on a hill and you have a standard, it just, it just everything happens perfectly. You got you to gotta let up off the clutch real slow and, and hold on to the, to, to the brake so that it don't keep rolling forward. And then you have to ease off so it don't jump real too fast. Well, I, I'm guiding him with my voice. I'm like, back up. Yeah. And he, he backs up. And I'm, then I have to tell him to stop because he don't run me over. And so I tell him to stop. And, uh, and anyways, by that time, when he finally stopped, he was, he was standing, he was sitting in the, in, in the driver's seat just shaking. Because he, he thought he had killed me. Because he couldn't hear me no more. He thought I was dead. And everybody had run over there from across. I, I'm telling you, I screamed loud. I screamed so loud if an airplane was flying over, he would have heard. Like, what is that? I screamed that loud. And uh, everybody had come over there and they chalked the wheels of that truck. And I was able to get out. But I had two thoughts that day that went across my mind. The, the first thought I had was my dad had went down the road to, uh, to Few Ready Mix to borrow a tool for a job we were doing. And the first thought was, man, I wish my dad was here. He, could, he would help me in this situation. But the other thought that hit my mind was, if I die right now, I know where I'm going. And I, and I had that feeling, is, is this what people feel right before they die? But that started something in me. And I, I, I began to seek, is there a God? And my wife bought me this Bible before we ever came to church. She bought me this Bible and I began to read it. I remember sitting on a deer stand reading John 14. Where it says, show us, Philip said unto him, show us the Father, and it shall suffice us. And he said, have I been with you so long, Philip, yet thou hast not known me. On a deer stand, not knowing anything about God, I found, I found out who he was. And God began to speak things to me and reveal things to me that I had never known before. And I just kept saying, God, I, I want more, I want more. And he would speak to me. I would read his word every day. And my dad was, was still backslid at the time. And, and, I, and I would come to him and I'd say, Dad, did you know that there's one God? He showed me. God showed me who he was. And that began to work on my dad. And I, and I remember, and I remember uh, times that we were talking in the shop. I had never seen my dad cry in my life. I've never seen him cry. And, 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 and we were, we would, he would just break down and start crying in the shop. And I would say, Dad, what's wrong with you? And he'd say, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I don't feel good. But it was years of telling God no. Years of God saying, I want to restore you. And him saying, no, I, I'm there's no way I can live for you right now. I have this and I have this going on. And uh, if I do this, they will never live for God. So there's no point in it. There's no way that I can live for God by myself. In years of saying no, it gets easier and easier and easier to say no. And so he was calloused. 
But God began to answer some prayers that my grandmother laid up in heaven. And God began to massage that heart until it was pliable again. And my dad spent a lot of time building up walls. Some of you that have family that are not where they need to be in God right now, just understand that they're building up walls right now. My dad built up walls and the Lord was moving on him. He wouldn't even come to my baptism because he knew. I told him, I said, Dad, I mean, I was in search for truth. I said, Dad, I, I'm getting baptized today. He said, man, well, that's great. I said, in Jesus' name. He knew that weeks before that, I was baptized another way. And I said, Dad, tonight. He said, well, that's great. But I can't come. Because he knew he didn't, he couldn't be around the presence of God. Growing up, my grandmother, the only thing she ever wanted for Mother's Day was my dad to be in church with her, you know. And as a kid, not knowing anything, I would say, what sense does that make? If he goes one day out of the entire year. But I understand now that she was saying, and I, just like we know, one church service, anything can happen. And she was basically saying, if maybe if I get him in the presence of God and, and he can feel his power and his presence again, maybe, maybe he will, he'll change and, he'll, and, and maybe he'll pray back through the Holy Ghost. But, but my grandmother didn't get to see that. But, I was, uh, God would, had been working on my dad and I had been witnessing him crying and, 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 and seeing him break down. And, and, and so, uh, me and my wife, we had went to, uh, we went to Lufkin to just to get away from everything. And we picked the worst day imaginable to do it on. <laughs> it was, uh, it was snowing. It had, it had snowed that whole day and it was freezing and the snow melted and the ruts on 63 and then froze back over and, you know, everything was icy and we shouldn't have never went, but we did anyway. And uh, my wife is driving and I'm sitting in this Honda Civic and I'm in the passenger seat and she says, what do I do? And I'm like, what do you mean? And whenever she said, Whenever I said, what do you mean? The car started going like this. And then it cut over into the other lane. And then as soon as it hit the grass, it started flipping. And uh, we flipped it at least five times. You know, nobody is, when you're flipping a vehicle, no one's saying one, two. <laughs> but I know how far we went and we had to at least have flipped five times. But uh, anyways, we, we skipped past some trees and we landed upright in a clear cut that, they, that loggers had just came and clear cutted. We landed upright and the first thing I did was look over at my wife and pray. Pray that she was okay and that everything was fine and her window had got busted. You know, and I look back and I say, man, she could have easily, her head could have went out that window. And then on the next turn, she could have been gone. But God kept his hands, his protective hands on us. And my dad had been in the fire department his whole life. And he had been to many wrecks where he had went and cut out people. And they're no longer with us today. And God used that to get a hold of my dad. Dad looked at everything. I mean, he, he walked up on the scene like he did many times in other situations. And he said that, that God spoke to him when he was looking at all that. And he said, I, this day I could have took him from you. 
God was trying to get his attention. But you know, the children of Israel, that's what happened to them. How many prophets did he send? How many chances? But you know, the Bible says that he chastened whom he loves. If he loves you enough, if he wants your attention enough, he'll do whatever it takes to get it. But dad said that, I say that, that walls thing because he said it. He said, I built up walls all around me. You know, uh, my aunt and uncle built up a wall in front of them. My, my, uh, my Mimo and my Papa built up a wall in front of them. But me and my dad had worked together every day for seven years. Every day, there, was, there wasn't a day that I didn't see him. We were close. We, we, make, we make Andy and Opie look like... <laughs> we make, it, make, it look, make them look like they don't get along. But my dad said that I built up walls and God knew that the only person that could get behind that wall was you. But that happened on a Friday and that Sunday my dad was in church. That the following, within a couple of weeks, my mother was baptized. I taught her a Bible study in her kitchen as a new convert that hadn't even got the Holy Ghost yet. And she came and she got baptized. And the next service that she was in, she received the Holy Ghost. And, and my wife, I, I look back and she's a Sunday school teacher now. And, and God has brought her so far. And she is so good with children. And kid, the, the children love her. But folks, I'm talking about the restoring power of God. The restoration of God. God may not have used dad the way he intended on using him. But he's still being used today. Every time we walk into a prison and the anointing is strong on him. And, and I see grown men with, with, with teardrop tattoos being touched by the Holy Ghost. And, and tears begin to flow. Brother, Brother Hill knows what I'm talking about. Uh, Brother Hill has been used in a mighty way in prisons. I'm telling you, when he's in the pulpit in prison, uh, the Holy Ghost comes upon him. And it, it's not, he's not, not even the same person. Brother... Brother Keith knows what I'm talking about. The, the anointing gets a hold of him. And, and, and my goodness, uh, uh, people get changed in their hearts. Get turned to God. Uh, I've seen it time and time again. We're, we're sitting at the baptistry and you got this hardened criminal uh, that, 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 that you know, society would say never will never amount to anything, can never change. But when you, when you look at them in the eyes and you say, Brother so-and-so, are you ready? Are you ready to be baptized? They start bawling like a, like, just like a baby. And they say, Lord, when, when I baptize you, just lift your hands. If you want the Holy Ghost, just lift your hands and, and thank Him for it. And we've seen, we've seen 21 receive the Holy Ghost in one night. This ministry matters to God, and I'm thankful to be a part of it. But I, I'm coming to a close, and what I want to leave you with is we have, we're supposed to have childlike faith. Brother Daniel, I, I don't have kids. We want kids. I just don't have any. But I, I have a nephew. I have several nephews and a niece. And I like to, I love playing with him. Like, here lately, Finn has been on a kick. He's, he's a cop. He's like, he calls me a criminal. And 
<laughs> chases me around the house. He said, put them hands behind your back, son. <laughs> You know, and he's, he's a, you know, he's a cop. And every now and then we'll switch it up and he'll get arrested and all that. Well, um, anyways, but I've seen him. How many seen a child break a toy? You know, it's so devastating to them. They just, they get beside themselves. They'll be playing with a car and then the wheel will come off. And then they'll, that's it. They will just start crying. But you know what they do? They do exactly what we do. We, they fight with it and try and try and try and try and try. And until they finally come up with, I cannot do this. I've got to take it to somebody. And then they give it to their daddy. And they say, Daddy, you're going to have to fix this. Because I can't do it no more. And that's how we are. It's time, it's time to get your hands off the pen. You know, sometimes, especially in the day and hour we're living in, we're living in a society that says, if you don't like the way your story is going, you can rewrite your story. But I've come to tell you, you cannot rewrite your story. It, you, your hands on the pen is what got you in the, where you're at right now. So, so we cannot rewrite our story. But we've got to hand it to the master. We have to say, God, whatever you want my story to be, whatever you want, whatever way you want to use me, if you if you just want me uh, to, to clean the toilets at the church, whatever you want to use me in, here's the pen, God. I'm tired of trying and I'm, I'm tired of re, uh, rewriting and rewriting and rewriting my story. And how many times have, have we been in the middle of God's story? God's writing, and we take the pen back. And we start erasing, and we start writing in our own things until, until we get the story so out of whack, we got to go right back to Him and say, God, here you go again. Please don't ever let me take this from you. But that's all I got for you this morning. But I... This is just what I've observed over the years of watching God restore people. I, I, I've seen, just like Gomer, someone be restored and then walk right back out. And then come right back in. But friend, I don't know about you, but I don't want to break God's heart. The Bible talks about crucifying him anew every day. But you know, when we wake up in the morning, we have a choice. Am I going to crucify my flesh? Or am I going to crucify him anew? Amen. Can we stand this morning? We've got a little bit of time here. We're going to... Um, here just in a few minutes, we're going to have a 15-minute break. Um, I thank you for your kind attention this morning, and I hope um, the Lord said something to you that, uh, that you needed. And I hope I didn't allow my flesh to get in the way of what He wanted to say. And, uh, but let's come back. We're going to take a 15-minute break here. But let's come back and... Let's all worship together. You know, whenever, whenever we praise Him, His presence comes down. And when His presence comes down, anything can happen. So anything can happen in this next service. But why don't we just, we all worship together and praise Him. And try to get everything that's going on, everything that's going wrong in our lives this past week, everything that's not right at work, Brother Kelly, I got, can I get a witness over there? <laughs> everything that's not right, everything that you need to do tomorrow, everything that you want to do today, let's get all that out of our minds. And let's just say, God, this is your day. And however, whatever I need from you, speak to my heart today. 
Because I promise you, if you'll listen, when our pastor gets behind this pulpit, God will give you something. The Word of God, I used to think that maybe this ain't for everybody, but there's something for everybody. Anytime a man of God gets behind the pulpit and he preaches, there is something. The whole message may not be for you, but there's something for everybody. But let's just get that in our hearts and our minds that, God, I just want to receive what you would have me receive today. Amen. You're dismissed.